welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz. Some of you might be able to see that. You're watching our, our video of this. And I'm joined by my extra special co-hosts. It's me, Jackie. It's 2021, but really 2022. <laughs> I made you from the past. <laughs> and it's me, Diana. Hey, everybody. Hi. I'm so excited. Do you know why? Nope. Nope. Because this is a live recording. Unlike most of our podcasts, which we actually also record live, but we're the only ones who know that. Everyone else gets them like a month later or, or three weeks later or something. But this one, we are recording right now. Coming in hot. With We got, we got a little bit. Little, so we got an audience. We got, so we got a friend out there. A live studio audience. And then we're... Yeah, my fancy outfit, though. Oh, that's okay. That's, I don't think anyone minds. And then we're recording this. So if you are a patron or subscriber, you are either here or you are watching the video version of all the shenanigans going on. So before we started the, the main recording, you actually got to hear us talking about Zoom problems and cookies, cookies and Walmart. all sorts of stuff. Can't believe we're you missed keep, it. We're keeping that? Christmas movies. It wasn't on the recording. <laughs> well, it'll, it'll be, it might, some of it might be in the video. We'll see. I might cut some of it out, but, but it's there, there for posterity. If you're just listening to the audio, you are confused and saying, what am I listening to? And I'll tell you, it's a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we talk about a given topic and discuss research articles related to that topic. And we're just, we're just excited because the camera's on, we got the, the light going, you know, it's very, very exciting. So Anything could happen. <laughs> it's so bright, but it feels, it feels very Walmart in here. Oh, a little bit. That light is the worst. <laughs> So again, if you're listening so to this, if you're listening to this, then we make we might may have made a terrible mistake and just messed it all up, but it'll get cut out. You won't have heard it. If you're watching this, though, I'm not editing that. That's too hard. So you will just get to see all the flubs. How is the sausage made? And again, if you are uh, listening to this and you say, man, you know what? This episode's not long enough. I wish I could also watch people mess up <laughs> and go back and re-record. You know, you, you should go over to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. You could be seeing this all happen as it goes, as opposed to the, the finely edited version of the three-hour podcast. You know, it cuts down to no. one and a half. You oh, know, okay. really. No, like, I'm nope. kidding. <laughs> Don't scare Jaw. We Don't have a four Don't hours of content. Our, listener. our editor cuts it down really well to like a meaningful hour and 15 minutes from all the other garbage that goes in. Anywho, why don't we get started? Because, you know, we got four hours ahead of us, right? At least for some people. But we'll be discussing behavioral cusps, which was voted on, actually, by by patrons are our topic. Some people wanted to talk about direct instruction. I'm not saying who, and that got, I think, a vote. It had zero for a very long time. I think someone took pity on direct instruction. And abduction prevention was our That's other topic. That's what I wanted to talk That's about. That's what Jackie wanted. And uh, behavioral cusps was the winner. And who chose that topic, Diana? I proposed that topic. The list you you chose. I was going to say, I misspoke. Yes, you proposed it. Why did you propose behavioral cusps? Well, we hadn't talked about it before. So that Which bumped it up the list. I know. I know. How did that happen? Because it's actually kind of hard to talk oh, yeah, about. Certainly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was like that time that someone asked us to talk about CMOs back in episode 42. We're <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh, no. Like, and eventually sure? we're like, I guess we should try. So it's a little it's not, it's not quite CMOs, but it's a little bit confusing. But I actually wanted to talk about this topic because I've been thinking a lot about how we should best I'm it's killing like Rob I'm killing These are, it's, you know if you're listening to this you, and that probably just sounded like speed. we should just best it actually was <laughs> 30 minutes straight of pauses I often have my students tell me that it's like they understand assessment right They're like I get assessment I gotta check for all these skills but then after that how do I pick from this huge list what is actually the most important thing to target first and that is in and of itself a skill, right? So I wanted to talk about behavioral cusps from that perspective of bringing in the conversation of understanding how cusps fit in with development so that we as practitioners can best choose learning target. That's smart. Mm. I'm glad you've been thinking about that. Yeah. It's cool. Thanks so much. <laughs> Well, we, well, we, just fangirling each other. Just, I'm like, just guess wow. it's fans of each other. But before we do that, <laughs> You're so smart. we should probably so smart. just say, tell everyone what articles we are discussing, which again, for a topic I think everyone's heard of and says, oh, behavioral cusp, very important. There aren't a very lot of articles about behavioral cusps. Well, I think well, there's, 
Yeah, there's, there's some. There's, there's some, but there's not a lot of re- like empirical because it's it's it goes a little bit beyond empirical it's, articles. It's theoretical. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. Theoretical, and it's it's a little subjective in the way like that behavior analysts don't love, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. it's it even goes a little farther than social validity, right? Because you're teaching a skill, and then I don't want to spoil it. What happens? But right. <laughs> But then it matters what other people and the individual think more so than like on a one to five scale. No, that's true. But, but I, I sort of see behavioral cusp research as maybe being like a, a Venn diagram of job carving or, you know, vocational community research plus social validity research plus some other stuff that we'll I think discuss. It's so much more than vocational work, though, too, you know? But I'm, I'm, no, no, but it's not, not, I don't mean vocational in the sense of it's only looking at, you know, specific jobs, oh. but that same idea of like, well, how do you determine what jobs people want to do? Oh, well, okay. you look at what's available in the community and you talk about sure. what skills need to be taught and what needs to be learned. And you look at the individual's current behavioral repertoire, it, that same idea. But instead of it, again, just focusing on jobs, it focuses on everything, everything, Right. Every skill. Again, you wouldn't you wouldn't do your paper on everything, but you would have to title your paper behavioral cusps colon everything something, because that's how every article we have tonight is phrased. Diana, what are are we reading, by the way? Oh, okay. It's 2022. So that's your that's your job now. I'm excited. I love this job. So We have three articles we're going to talk about tonight. The first one is the OG article behavioral cusps colon a developmental and pragmatic concept for behavior analysis. I'm so glad the OG like came into the world. Oh yeah, so we don't have to say the original paper. We can say OG. I think it came from Teen Mom, but just, just OG. Yeah, like the OG Teen Moms season I one. I don't think that's that's not where it from. came from. <laughs> well, because you know, sometimes you use the term seminal article. It sounds so uppity. I use it too, but I like right. Original. But like the origin of the word seminal is just semen, which mm-hmm. is gross. That is a family is podcast. All right. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, that's amazing, right? So I'm it's just always like, gonna laugh. I'm like down with the patriarchy, man. So anyway, this article is, as everyone out there already knows, by Rosales, Ruiz, and Bear, and it was published in Java, 1997. The next one is the Behavioral Cusps: Colon, a model for selecting target behaviors, and that's by Bosch and Fuquay, published in Java, 2001. And then we will talk about Behavioral Cusps: Colon. A person-centered concept for establishing pivotal individual, family, and community behaviors and repertoires by Smith, McDougall, and Edelin Smith in Focus on Autism and Other Developmental Disabilities, 2006. Okay. So I, th- I think in discussing these articles, we'll of course start with Rosales, Ruiz, and Bear, but I don't know, kind of preparing for this, I realized, I think I just read the Bosch and Fuquay article way back when and just you know, remember the citation and sort of conflated the two articles like, oh, I've read both of those articles. Yeah, I don't think I had actually read the Rosales Ruiz and Bear prior to this episode. And in some ways, I'm kind of happy because I think what we gain out of discussing behavioral cusps, a lot of that content really wasn't in the Rosales Ruiz and Bear article. It, it was like don't their goal. No, no, it was a very, it was, it was such a smart article, but I feel like their mission in writing it was not the mission that I usually think of when I'm talking about, well, why would I want to know about behavioral cusps, which is sort of, you know, I want to, you know, specifically better the lives of of the individuals that I'm, I'm supporting and I'm helping by like finding that magic response that just opens up all the doors. Whereas Rosales Reason Bear is not, that that's not exactly what they're talking about, or at least in terms of planning, they're talking about it from a, a bit of a different perspective. I appreciated their perspective. And that paper is so hard to read. Mm-hmm. It is deep. It's a dense one. The so, other reason why I like Bosch and Fuquay because it's like three pages, three pages long. Right? Mm-hmm. When I was reading this, Diana and I were heating up some tea at our job. And I was like, whoo, yeah. I'm going to have to take a minute, do a little reading, take a minute, digest what I just read, and then go back, read it again because it was dense. I thought it was helpful, but very dense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I've read it, but I guess I never read it, read it. Because mm. I was like, am I reading for this first time? Like, no, it's in my classes. But man, did I not talk about it then in a way that was appropriate. <laughs> right. So your professor may not have assigned this one 
and assign the Bosch and Fuquay because it is more digestible. Yes. And I think it's more about the application of the concept. Whereas For sure. Mm-hmm. That wasn't really the purpose of Rosazri's and, and Bear. But you know, let's let's stop beating around the bush. Let's get right to the meat of, of the issue. Stop by, beating around the bear. Stop beating around the bear. It's beating you need two the... sticks and you go bang, bang, Rosazri's. bang, bang. <laughs> to scare the bears away. That's right. Like an apparent trap. The parent mm. trap. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do my very best to break this down for everyone in a way that is digestible. So like I said, I really wanted to talk about this topic for the application side of it, because I do think that people, you know, get the idea of assessment. People are very good at writing behavioral objectives and then teaching the things that they decide are going to be where the targets. But it's that step in between that maybe doesn't get discussed that much that can give people a harder time. Like, how do I actually pick <laughs> from these things? So I, that's where I want us to end up in this conversation, and I hope that we get there. But before we do that, I <laughs> am going to take us down this other path to make sure that we understand the theoretical background for behavioral cusps. And like I said, I will do my best. It is a dense article. So if you guys don't agree with what I'm saying or don't understand or think if I don't understand, I won't I say anything. What I'm talking about, then you can interrupt me and we can uh, have a different type of conversation. Or listeners can, can write in. All right. So Rosales Ruiz and Bear wrote this article in 1997 as a behavior analytic, I don't want to use rebuttal, but response to the common idea in developmental psychology of developmental stages. So if you learn about child development or go through any developmental psychology course, you are likely going to learn about stages of development. And the idea there is any young child is going to move in sort of a an expected organized pattern through most of their motor goals, most of their fine motor goals, most of their language goals, most of their cognitive and perceptual goals, etc. And we can sort of expect kids to meet these goals within a certain period of time. And that is because their brains are developing and hitting these different developmental stages. I like it when they call them critical windows. Mm. Yeah. Because then I imagine that like they're once you've gone out of that, the window's just like. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I imagine anyway, when I'm thinking about these stages, it's like, oh, you're past that critical window. It's gone. Right. Shattered. But it's probably not. No, no, it's 100% not. Really gone. This article isn't meant to like totally throw stones at the developmental psych literature. It's just more, moreover saying, hey, we don't disagree that children develop in this way, but are we really thinking about this in the most parsimonious explanation? Mm-hmm. And so they say, let's apply a behavior analytic analytic lens to the stages of development and see if we can't come up with something that is fits within the behavior analytic realm of how we might explain what psychologists call developmental stages. So that's what we're doing in mm-hmm. this article. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, helpful for us to think about as practitioners in that we would want to select our learning targets in such a way that they would, you know, roughly fit within the natural progression that we would expect to see for development, but also understanding that it's quite individualized, each child's development on their own. Okay, so they start out, I I put a quote in here. I actually love this quote, so I'm glad you put it in here (laughs) because I was probably going to bring it up if you didn't. Great. So so they spend the first part of the article talking about what I just did. So let's see if we can explain this more simply. And then the quote is, I think is this is paraphrased, but it says, is the butterfly a caterpillar just in order to produce another butterfly? Right? So the end result is a butterfly, but it has to go through the stage of being a caterpillar in order to make another butterfly. Or should, can we think about it on the flip side? Maybe it's the caterpillar that's like the, the end result and it's just using a butterfly in order to become another caterpillar, which is funny, but they're attempting to explain like how one might move through these developmental stages and do is there actually purpose to it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I know I liked about that is that I always have a hard time conceptualizing teleological like Mm -hmm. discussions Mm -hmm. and I have a hard time like thinking about it 
And this, like, for some reason, <laughs> this one phrase, like, wrapped it all up for oh, yeah? me, right? Because it's true. Like, are we in this stage? We should be doing that. Are we doing this because we're in this stage? Right. Or mm-hmm. are we in this stage because we're doing it? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, that is a perfect example of, like, circular reasoning right. because there is no answer that you can answer, right? Mm-hmm. It just keeps going and going and going. The chicken and, going. and egg thing. Yeah. And then you fall down. Right, because you're so dizzy because you've gone in circles. <laughs> or, or the idea of developmental stages, which, I mean, depending on which sort of developmental model one is following, there's sort of a sense of, like, this is how it has to progress. And, sure. like, well, how do you go from stage one to two? Well, you, you do because you have to go to stage two so you can get to stage three. Yeah. So you can become a grown-up, I guess. I, I'm not, you know, it, it, again, it, it's sort of describing a number of observable events and then trying to put some sort of a logic behind them which which you know doesn't necessarily exist the way it's often explained like like it has to be that way like it's predetermined exactly what the stages will look like and the variability therein is well that's just that's the window that's 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 just what it's going to look like it's within our standard deviations don't worry too much about it yeah it always looks like this the person in in search of a the next stage of development you can even get an app for it Right when you're like have a baby. Oh yeah, and they're like, oh, eight weeks. Here's all the things that are gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, your baby's probably crying right now mm-hmm. because they're they're making a whatever leap. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then your baby's not doing that, and you're like, oh. No, but but then it, they do it later. And, and many like, of those, oh, many right? of those are are really looking more at sort of physical, like possible physical milestones. Which again, there's going to be variability. Right. Uh, but it, but you know, it's not that there aren't developing factors within. An organism so much as if we're just describing behaviors that we'd expect to see within certain windows that might be gained at certain points because reason because that's how development is question mm-hmm. mark yeah we're not really adding much to the discussion i think that, that was some of what i got out of the article in terms of yeah like you said there's something wrong if you'd like to conceptualize development in this way i guess you can but you're adding variables and discussion points that don't bring anything to the conversation so much as just try to add in hypotheses that may or may not exist, that there is no real way to test to talk yes. about a process. Yeah, you're putting a period at the end. Yeah. Right? Not a question mark. It's just mm-hmm. a period. Yeah. And then you get to go home. Great. So good. You guys are on the same page as me. So that's great news. <laughs> <laughs> so Rosales, Ruiz, and Bear then introduce this idea of behavioral cusps, and they call it a pragmatic concept of development for behavior analysis. So I'm going to give you the, their initial quote on what a behavioral cusp is, which was, quote, what makes a behavior change a cusp is that it exposes the individual's repertoire to new environments, especially new reinforcers and punishers, new contingencies, new responses, new stimulus controls, and new communities of maintaining or destructive contingencies. So the idea here is that we see behavior change occur, and as that change happens the overall repertoire of behavior expands for that individual in a way that it could not if that particular behavior change had not occurred so we most often think about behavioral cusps as providing the opportunity for new reinforcers in new environments that could not be accessed otherwise but as you can see in this definition they They include so much into this idea of cusps, which honestly, I think makes it a little harder to understand because then you start being like, this is a cusp and this is a cusp and everything's Mm -hmm. a cusp. But the the core of it really is that idea of the introduction, behavior change that introduces new reinforcers in new settings that could not be accessed otherwise. And I love that they included the behavioral trap in this without saying behavioral trap. So they weren't like behavioral cusps will probably also lead you to a behavioral trap, which is like a maintaining community, yep. right? But I just, I love the name behavioral trap, so I just wanted to say it. Oh, see, I think it's a, not a good name. I love it. It's <laughs> like, you're trapped. Yeah. Well, let's, let's discuss what it is, and then we can, we can discuss I'm why. Going, it, oh, okay. I won't get yeah. into you're, it. You're I'm going to get there to it. Okay. Yet. So the, the classic examples that they give us and that you hear all of the time are a baby learning to crawl and a child learning to read. So... Those make sense, right? Before you can crawl, you are, you're at, at, as a parent, you're at that sweet spot, right? Mm-hmm. Your baby that can sit up and play on a blanket, but can't go anywhere. 
Listeners, if you have a baby, they can sit up and play on a blanket but cannot yet crawl. Enjoy that for now. Because once they are on the move, their whole world changes and opens up. And your world also changes because now you have a baby that can find all sorts of new delicious reinforcers to put into their mouth (laughs) that they could not previously access. That are probably not edible things. Well, they're babies, so it's not necessarily about taste that they're putting things into their mouth. That's what I'm saying. It's like... My baby ate poop outside, so... Right. Babies put things in their mouth. It's every single thing that they can reach. And now they can reach them because they can crawl. So before their world was restricted to whatever you placed on that blanket for them, and now it's anything that they can get their hands on. So their, their environment has expanded... And their potential reinforcers have also expanded in ways that could not have happened if they hadn't started crawling. And their communities in which they access those reinforcers might change. And then your behavior will also shape their behavior in ways that it never would have before. (laughs) Because you'll yell at them all the time. No, don't do that. Yeah, no. Stop eating that. Why are you doing that? Come back, baby. Like the the cartoon says, the dog says, my name is No No Bad Dog. What's your name? (laughs) And then reading too, right? That makes sense as well. So before you can read, you are you know limited to pictures or what other people tell you. And once you can read, whole new worlds, literal whole new worlds open up to you and you can access them on your own. Mm-hmm. Every time you say a whole new world, I want to be like, a whole new world. <laughs> Good, so you just, should. A little pitchy. You know what? I'm not a singer. You're the singer. Point um, of you. But just so you know, every time you say it, I'm in my head going to be doing that for the rest you can of, do it out loud. of the episode. I like it. Okay. And then I I threw in my own examples here too, right, for behavioral cusps. And you guys can tell me if you think these are good. I said being able to use a computer is a cusp. Mm -hmm. Then you can access the whole world of the internet and learning how to drive. Yes. I don't say yes yet because of the the other implications that behavioral cusps... The caveat. Okay. That, but I say potentially seems likely okay and for me i like driving the authors give us some others for they're myself like, they're like crawling and reading are of course ones that you're going to encounter but also generalized imitation is a cusp mm-hmm. i would 100 percent agree i use that as an example a lot too they talk about a child discriminating parent approval from disapproval as a cusp because that's gonna you know shape their future behavior and allow them to access new reinforcers then they mentioned spending disposable income, and that one just did not make sense to me, me either. I was maybe like, they, maybe the, they just been spending. No, I guess they wouldn't phrase it as disposable. They were income. like disposable income opens up all these new reinforcers. I'm like, but what's the behavior change? I have no idea. There, so I, that more one didn't, things. It's dis- like you didn't can buy hit stuff. for me more reinforcers. You can that, directly right, but that purchase the, your reinforcers now. But spending is the reinforcer, not. I mean, the behavior, right? not inheriting wealth. That's not really behavior. No, <laughs> I mean, I wish that was behavior right. that I was in. Engaging in right now. <laughs> but is, is your question with the, the spending is spending not being behavior no, or the disposable they, income? They didn't say spend. They said before the spending, they said having disposable income is a cusp. Oh, I mean, they meant earning disposable income then. They need to like give your kid an allowance and now they can like figure right. out how to spend money. Like I get the, I get it in that sense, right? It's going to teach them a lot of new things, but. I guess I always think about a cusp as the behavior change itself, mm-hmm. as as an agent of the learner versus something that happens to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But maybe I'm not fully understanding. No, I didn't. Get, I actually, anyway. when I read that part, I was like, I'm not there with you. I, I'm not there okay. with you. Well, that one threw me, but that's okay. Then I was just like, <laughs> and then I kept reading. <laughs> Keep going. So after they laid that out for us, they said, okay, really key part of all of this is that we're talking about these cusps, but there's an important caveat, like we said, which is it has to be important to the person. So the behavior change that occurs and then all the subsequent changes that they can now access have to be important to them in order for that change to be meaningful and to then to be maintained. So that could be important to the person themselves and or, of course, their larger community that they are a part of, mm-hmm. too. So we can't forget that that is an important piece can I tell you, can I just add in my favorite quote? Yeah. One child's cusp may be another child's waste of time. <laughs> that is a good, I didn't write that one down, but that's a good I one. I did though. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was like, Ooh, that's mm-hmm. amazing. Right. We can teach a skill, but it won't be a cusp unless it's important to the individual. Totally. But then also, and like you said, Anna, and well, it said in the article also to the, the community at large is, is also a component because just because, oh, now I can drive. And if your parents spend all day then yelling at you and anytime you drive, you found a value in it. But 
they they take away the car or they punish you, then it may no longer be actually a, a meaningful cusp. Because I know I kind of I I kind of want to argue on that point mm -hmm. only because I guess I I agree but disagree. Mm -hmm. Right? I think the cusp should. If we're thinking about as an application, I think we really should be thinking about the individual and what matters to them. First and foremost, the most important thing, right? It's their lives. They're the ones that are directly impacted. And then secondary measure, thinking about parents. I would, I would, I would prefer that we just define the cusp as value to the individual. But then I think when we get into the later articles and we start discussing assessing cusps and is this an important cusp and is this a valuable cusp, that's where you start getting a lot of other players in the cusp game. Yeah, but if the behavior is within the person's repertoire, but they're just limited from engaging in it for whatever environmental restriction, I think that if it still has import to them, then it's still a cusp. But if they can't access the reinforcers or the new communities because of the impact of other individuals in their environment, parents, other members of society, and they can't access the reinforcers anymore. Is it still really a cusp? You yeah. have to change their environment, right? But who will change their environment? They can. What if they can't change their environment? Because society is keeping them down. They have to find a new society, right? Because society is different. You know, like all communities are different. There's verbal communities everywhere. No, I mean, they, well, so. I, I think we, I think that that goes beyond. So there's sort of the yeah. definition of the cusp, and then there's how do you choose a cusp, and how are cusps affected, and and they. They can be hard, I think, to disentangle. That's, I think my main takeaway when I think about cuffs is that it should matter directly to the individual. Yep. Yeah. I agree. All right. So then they give us another nice quote that I added in here. Quote, when a cusp is achieved, a set of subsequent changes important to someone. <laughs> They're like, we're not going to tell you who. Suddenly becomes easy or highly probable. Right. So that's another addition of how we can think about this definition is once we see that initial behavior change occur there's a whole cascade of subsequent behavior changes that are much more likely to occur now that we had that initial first step and on the flip side without that cusp happening it's there's very little chance that we would see further change in that sort of domain which again the cusps i mean uh, sorry the crawling example supports that right so if you didn't crawl you wouldn't then have a means of accessing those other reinforcers because you'd still be stuck on the blanket they let us know that a lot of behavior may need to change to produce a cusp or not that much it really depends also not all cusps are good example addiction they let us know that i think that's helpful though i think a lot of times when we're talking about cusps we're thinking like oh what's going to be good right but sometimes like when you're thinking about the natural environment and you're trying to explain why after one behavior occurred, there was a cascade of effects, right? You can call that a cusp. And be, it's just not a great, an ideal cusp, right? But it's one way we can categorize, you know, an escalation of mm -hmm. um, some sort of behavior. The other example in that category of things that weren't so good was asking, learning how to ask for help right away if something's hard rather than trying it first for yourself, right? Because that would produce reinforcement but it might not be in the person's best interest. My example that I thought might fit into there was kind of similar, but like being the class clown, right? So like mm. learning to act out and get laughs from everybody in class, but that wouldn't be to your own benefit. And then they want to make sure that we understand behavioral cusps as compared to behavior traps, as compared to pivotal behavior. Oh. Yep. So <laughs> <laughs> like, what are oh. just <laughs> distinctions of little value, I think, to the average individual? For 500, please. <laughs> okay, so just briefly, behavior traps was a term that already existed pre-1997, and their definition for that is, quote, a community of reinforcement in the natural environment that could maintain and potentially shape new behavior of its members. This can happen in a school setting or university setting or potentially in like a work setting if you're there to learn a new career path, right? I thought would maybe another good example. Can I bring up an example from the later articles that I like? Yeah. There's one they talk about Sarah in, I want to oh, say yes. it was the, the Smith et al. Sarah, who her family took her to a basketball game. You know, she, she stayed at home, right, but yeah. she liked sports and she went to a basketball game. And 
now that she's there, you know, it allows her to access all the play, you know, talking to the players, talking to the vendors, talking to other members on the bench, watching buying the things. game, buying things. And, you know, so so her her, you know, walking to basketball game as the cusp, then leading to an environment where now she's she's behaviorally trapped and all <laughs> and will keep engaging in all sorts of new responses and increasing repertoires because there's so many new reinforcers that can be accessed through all, mm-hmm. of, not, all of her new behavior not to derail the conversation but she was a 27 year old and i wonder how old her grandparents were going to basketball games right maybe it was like a gilmore girls situation right? they were I really know. young like, who are these like nine-year-olds like killing it killing it i was like good for them because if that yeah. was the same person they brought up sarah a bunch in the in the smith article and her family kept coming it was like they just all of a sudden, one day, right? snapped like, you know what? We should do some stuff. Here we go. <laughs> Hopefully, these are cusps. And they all were. <laughs> but that, that's like, I stopped. I had to stop, stare at the ceiling for a little bit. Like, how old would her grandparents <laughs> be? You know what? They they had season tickets to the local <laughs> basketball game is all that matters in that, in that situation. I did not think about that. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. So but that's an example of a behavior trap, which I think is a terrible term, right? Like, could, could we name things worse? In behavior analysis, behavior trap sounds terrible, but the point is that the... It sounds like a way, like, when children are misbehaving, you must make sure that you right? end up in I mean, your behavior trap. that's what people probably trap. think. It's, You're never getting out. Right. We've trapped Just you. Just terrible. So, behavior trapped you. So the idea is that there is sort of a low-level response effort, entry response into these different environmental settings. And then once you're there, there's just so many opportunities for learning and reinforcement that you just keep going. Like you're tripping over reinforcement exactly. everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to make a behavioral trap wrap. <laughs> Do it. Okay. Okay. 2022 okay. year in review. <laughs> Be my behavioral trap wrap. Okay. So they they bring up the point that these things are different, but they probably have some overlap. And we could likely think about those entry responses to a behavior trap as a behavioral cusp. So it's like when you've got your you've got your box, you know, and it's it's held up by a twig. Sure. That's the behavioral trap. But the the, the little piece of fruit underneath and, and then walking to get the fruit. That's the cusp. And once you're there, you can get behavioral trapped. I, I can I can, ma- I can make metaphors to Rosaceries and Bear, you know. I don't know if that's exactly right, but... Literally, that's what it is. That is tra- that's the behavior. It trap. depends on how much reinforcement is in that trap, because generally speaking, a trap is usually void of reinforcement. There's a lot of fruit in there. So much fruit. So okay. much fruit. I think this tripping analogy over fruit. is not helping it. We gotta stop. All right. Okay, and then they talk about pivotal behavior. So Which just feels like behavioral cusp junior. No, 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 no. I know the distinction. I worked very hard on distinguishing the dis- the distinction between these two things. Okay. Like, like weeks. Great. Well, maybe you can help me then yes. to make sure I get it right. So they give a throwback to the Kegels to talk about pivotal behavior. Is it the Kegels or the Kegels? I think it's Kegel. I think it is too. <laughs> And they give us a definition here as well. So pivotal behavior is, quote, any behavior changes that result in collateral changes of other behavior as well. All Specifying right. untrained behaviors. Yes, they didn't say that. But the next sentence did. It said that the new skills are not specifically targeted in the initial training. So they give some examples of this, but they are not always going to function as cusps. Right. But rather you learn a skill in one setting and it's applicable in one way. And then you apply that behavior or skill in another way. I see, so like the, I think the example they gave was sort of, you know, learning eye contact is the pivotal behavior. And then because you engage in delivery of eye contact, you might, you know, you'll get the other social attention. Use that in other you, ways. You use that in other ways to and, yeah. you know, improve your conversation or to get more conversation bids or Mm -hmm. prompt more conversation bids from other individuals. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 you are right, but it's other behaviors that are not related to eye contact. So when you engage in eye contact, another SD may come and then you're going to engage in an untrained behavior an untrained response that is indirectly related to the targeted behavior. So that's why it's not like quite response generalization because the reinforcer may be different. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not going to, it's not going to look like the untrained response. So it's not part of the same response class, but it emerges due to the different salient cues in the environment. 
That's how I, I, I came came across it. Okay. So pivotal behaviors can be behavioral cusps, right? Mm-hmm. But they don't have to be behavioral cusps. Can be pivotal behaviors, but they don't have to be. So right. it really is context specific in what happens within the environment, and if there's new opportunities for reinforcement or untrained skills. So if it's an untrained skill that emerges, then it's going to be a pivotal behavior. And if that also produces access to new contingencies, new reinforcers, then it can also be considered a behavioral cusp. I think that's what's so hard is that there's overlap between the two, but Mm -hmm. it's not a perfect Venn diagram. It's only a sometimes Venn diagram. It's like a... It's like a triangle. <laughs> and, I th- and I think the Smith article kind of used them used them interchangeably. They or They refer to they pivotal sure behaviors did. as yep. behavioral cusps are a type of pivotal behavior. In, whereas the Rosales, Reese, and Bear article describes them as two separate categories. The BAC Beyond the Fifth Edition specifies them separately. Oh, I was going to say, I hope they just kind of were like, they don't. Yeah, do a slasher. They are separate. And that is why I used to just kind of gloss over it and be like, yeah, you can yeah, figure right. it out. But then someone was like, no, look, it's in the task list. I want all of our yeah. listeners to, if they're consulting, I want them to explain to someone the difference, you know, someone they're consulting about the difference between pivotal behaviors and behavioral cusps and write back and tell us how much they fired you and said, get out of my house. I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Conceptually, does it matter? No. But clinically, do you want to look for both? Probably. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much, Jackie. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to move on from that. I feel like my life is better now that I have a slight understanding of the distinction between the two. To how, be honest, how nice. though, me too. I like spent so long. I read every article on pivotal behaviors because I didn't understand it. And people kept asking me the questions and I'd be like, I don't know. What do you think? Right? <laughs> yeah. Pure university I, professor. I was kind of being sarcastic. I don't really oh, care. I do care. I care because they're, you know, authors have made the distinction. And I think in order for us to dispel the distinction, we have to understand the distinction and what they're coming from. Do and you want to dispel it? Kind of. You don't think it's... I th- I want to have them together. Oh, okay. Right? I want them You just under- want one term. I want one term. Oh, okay. But you just said that the task list separate. Okay. Yes, the task list does. Sorry. But I want one term that just talks about behavior that's important and does all of these things. Yeah. Let's come up I with really a new term. I really think we term. get into the weeds when we try to have this conversation and it... Yeah. No one... It doesn't matter no, that much it doesn't to matter. 99% of behavior analysts, which are already 0.001% right. of that's, that's what I mean. other people. <laughs> we want to make ourselves likable and we want someone to listen to us. All right. We can just call these different things. What about this? I'm going to brainstorm real quick. Just a minute. Behavioral warps. Okay. Like warp speed ahead with your behavior because no. you've got, okay. Behavioral leaps. That one's already u- being used in the developmental literature. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like what they're going to use in your article, but let's not talk about it yet. All right. Okay. So then they wrap up this first section (laughs) by saying that behavioral cusps, it's really important that they carry importance. I said that badly, but the point we already made about it's got to be socially valid, right? For the, for the individual is really, really key. So the importance should be determined by a the extent of the behavior changes they systematically enable, B, whether they systematically expose behavior to new cusps, and C, the audience's view of whether, the audience being like the client, basically, whether these changes are important for the client slash organism, okay? So it really should be meeting the importance criteria in all of those different areas that it produces a lot of change, We're going to see a lot of different opportunities for responding in these new environments due to the cusp and that whoever it's important to also finds it meaningful and important. And if it's meeting those criteria, then yes, we probably have a cusp. I like a cusp makes a cusp makes a cusp. Right. What comes first, cusp or cusp? Okay. So all of that was just them saying, look, everyone, I have a new idea about a new term and this is what it is. And this is why I think it's important. Then from there, now we're going back because remember, we introduced this whole idea just because we wanted to say maybe we could call the developmental stage of something else. So now this section is titled Small Convergences, Small Convergences of Traditional and Behavior Analytic Views. So now we're bringing back in the developmental psychology perspective and saying we often talk about child development in terms of behavior analytic stages. However, 
this could be potentially problematic for behavior analysts because it proposes what the, our authors say is age specific mental structures, which is not really necessary, right? We don't typically talk about structures within the brain. We just talk about behavior that happens in or outside of the skin. So they say that this is theoretical overreach. We don't need all of this explanation, right? Explanatory fiction in order to talk about behavior as it occurs over the lifespan. But they say they don't want to, you know, put all of this, all of psychologists in this one bucket. They say, actually, there is overlap between what we're presenting as a developmental behavior analytic view with other aspects of psychology. So cognitive psychology actually has a fair amount of overlap with behavior analysis in that we both observe and analyze behavior. We see behavior as changed by environmental events and contingencies. And everyone's mostly in agreement that behavior can come under control of those environmental contingencies and behave in a relatively systematic way. So what this really ends up looking like is that we can talk about child development as like this quote unquote thing, but that doesn't mean that it's always gonna look the same for each child, and there actually could be quite a different range of behavior that is going to be under the control of these differing contingencies, right? So we're not saying that every child develops in the same way, but that they likely are following patterns of responding due to individual environmental contingencies that are in place that are producing behavior that's lawful slash orderly for that individual child. And we see development occur along these, what kind of maps onto the developmental stages through access to new behavior cusps and the new environments, reinforcers, and additional behavior that each of those produces. So they say we can, you know, distill this all down and talk about it in terms of contingencies and reinforcement rather than relying on developmental stages to make these types of explanations. Okay. And then they they added in. At this point, what was my favorite metaphor of theirs? They said, we could think about cusps as steps along a path or maybe more so branches on a tree. Same. I wrote it down too. I'm like, love this branch metaphor. Some are longer, some are shorter. Exactly. You ever thought about people are like, trees man <laughs> and like like we all have a trunk but like some of our branches go this way and some of them go that way and there are twigs and leaves we were like jiving at this and we're like i was like oh yeah Whoa. yeah i am there yeah we had a drum circle actually with rosales rubies and bear wait which came first the butterfly or the caterpillar is it my job <laughs> to become that in, a butterfly that in, that's good. Whoa. <laughs> okay so they said everyone pretty much starts with the trunk Right. That's kind of like the given. So that's the initial development. Mm -hmm. But then from there, everyone branches out. Oh, look at that in their own way. And those branches, like you said, are maybe longer or maybe thicker or maybe turn in different directions, depending on what is of importance to you as you're progressing through different cusp behaviors, which Mm -hmm. I think is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I actually got a little weepy. (laughs) So it must have been the day I was reading it, but I was, you know, a little tired. I hadn't had cookies yet. And right. I was like, this is so profound. <laughs> so anyway, it was it was pretty nice. And mm-hmm. and they say, you know, there's there's going to be cusps that are teachable and then some that are not teachable. And they do not deny that there is a, a developmental progression occurring here. Right. So there are neural developments and neural maturities that have to occur and physical physical maturity and physical and chemical maturities, maturity. yes before one can reach some cusps but but so they're not like arguing like we don't believe in development it's more just like look at this you know simpler more parsimonious way of explaining more individualized mm-hmm. way. And more individualized too yeah. yeah more humane so where we see where we tend to see patterns of cusp development which while different to some extent for all human organisms, will probably follow lawful and somewhat orderly patterns mm-hmm. to some extent. That's where the illusion of the aha, you've reached the I forget all my stages of know, psychology right? yeah. because they're, they're kind of irrelevant. Object permanent. Too many, yeah. <laughs> Something with Piaget and ducks is in there. So, but that idea of well, what, what, you know, the developmental psychologist might say, ah, you're in the second stage mm-hmm. or the oral motor stage really is just trying to overly define patterns that 
tend to focus around certain skills that a lot of human organisms cusps that they reach sort of at that time, possibly because of physical development, possibly because of the community they're in. Well, it, because of both, certainly, yeah, yeah. you know, the impact yeah. is going to change based and on And they're not even who, saying where. like, oh, these aren't useful. They they even admit like, it's useful to think about behavior right. stages mm-hmm. of development. Bijou did this too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's almost like, like they just want to back it up with this theoretical perspective. With my rap that I'm going to make. Yeah. yeah. Or why might you see... Why might you see patterns of behavior that al- a- allow scientists to sort of think of, wow, it just seems like they've entered the stage where all of these behaviors happen. And rather than thinking of it as, well, that's just what happens when you turn two to three. It's just yeah. you magically do all these things because you have to do them to get to the next yeah. stage. Yeah. We're really talking about in- interaction with the environment. Yeah. So Access to more reinforcers in a way that shows that, you know, behavior explosion. Yeah. So I, th- I think if we, you know, I hopefully that was a good summary of you did just what it job. means when we talk about behavior costs thank you but when we start to think about learning targets i feel like there's a couple takeaways here one is if you are working with young children you should know that developmental trajectory right so that you are not you know married to it to infinity but so that you have an idea of what typically or usually comes next so if you're making plans for programming or behavioral targets for your child client that you're not overshooting and saying let's work on something that's way over here that might be like three cusps away Mm -hmm. i've done that before and it takes a long time and it's very hard Mm -hmm. yes and that's frustrating for the client and for for everyone and if the child hates what you've taught them it no longer is a cusp even though you thought it was defined as a cusp yes and that was my second point which sorry is sometimes right if you're building the trunk of the tree right there may be things that kind of have to go in a certain progression but then if you're working with other clients like sarah who's going to be in your study you have many more things available to pick from and the important thing there it's it's hard to make a prediction about like this is definitely going to be a cusp but Mm. if we're coming at it from the perspective of this is important to the client and i could teach this and then i can I can think of this, 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 and this that are going to be other things that they could then access. That is a a great way to build in cusps for a learner who's at a different developmental stage. Well, so now we understand the definition of cusp and behavioral cusp. When we come back after a little break, we can talk about what do we do with this information and how would it be relevant to our work as clinicians. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking about behavioral cusps. But before we continue on, the cusp that matters most to you is remembering our secret code words. Because if you don't have those, you're not able to get a CE for listening to this episode. So that's a cusp. <laughs> don't tell the listeners what's cusp. That that's up to them, Diana. Write in. Was that a cusp okay. or was it pivotal? What's, what's the code word? <laughs> the code word. Well, you need the code word because you need to be able to go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs. That's G E T hyphen C E U S to enter those code words mm-hmm. so that you can earn a C E. And the first one is crispy. C R I S P Y. Jackie just ate some crispy chips or pommes de terre. They were good. They were good, said Jackie. All right, crispy. 
All right. So I know usually we do sort of a half and half before we do these breaks, but I think the discussion of behavioral cusps as sort of a description of developmental stages or an explanation for developmental stages is the part of behavioral cusps that few people either know about or discuss, because usually what we're talking about behavioral cusps are what's featured in our other articles, which is, okay, what's a good behavioral cusp? How can we use the concept of behavioral cusps for more meaningful planning for the individuals that we are that we are supporting, that we are helping? And both of these these two articles, so the, the Bosch and Fuque and the Smith. Smith, thank you. I'm having a hard time remembering Smith, Smith at all. Really are kind of the same article with different examples of what a cusp <laughs> might be. I found I found the the Smith article like a backup. Like if you're gonna read both, if you're gonna read one of them, you should just read both of them because mm. it solidifies mm. right. Yeah. If you're like, I've well, only got a few more. seconds, I better read Bosch and Fuque because it yeah. gives me like the bullets of what's important. But if I want some examples and right. I want a little bit more information, then yeah. Smith et al. has got my back. Yeah, I like that. So well, let's talk about those and we'll sort of just interchangeably go between the two of them. That seems smart. So, right. So in 2001, Bosch and Fuque or Fuqua, Fuque, I think it's Fuque. I actually asked him one time. I've heard someone else pronounce it Fuque because I was never sure. Yeah. So I'm going with that from now on. (laughs) But it might be helpful to identify guidelines that we can use as clinicians to potentially identify behaviors that may serve as cusps and use those to help identify, you know, what we're going to use as objectives, train those behaviors first. And so I love that they use this. This could be analogous to our reinforcer assessments or our preference assessment where we help to identify reinforcers that we can use in programming and this more structured approach, although they don't really give us a structured approach, but they give us guidelines for a structured eh. approach. No, neither article does. No. They sort of start hinting at it a little more. And even Smith, right. I feel like they're like, oh, you know, the Bosch and Fuquay talked about these. Here's a tiny bit more. It's like, what do you want us to pay you for the rest of the article, guys? Come on. Like, where, where, where do we behind, go from like, here? like one of those walls. Paywalls. Huh? It's like a puzzle. It's yeah. like a, it's like here are the corners. You know, you yeah, work on the, the border. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like you could use these. They have they've identified five five different variables that you could look at to as I guess delineate whether your behavior could be a behavioral cusp and which would be more important. You know, it's like how would you define a hierarchy of cusp? Well, what they said, yeah, I guess right. And what they said is if it. There's overlap. If you can say yes to more than one of these, then it could be considered a behavioral cusp. And the more you can say yes to, the more important the behavior may be, which I liked. Mm -hmm. And so they had five. um, And I'll tell you what those five are. The first one. Before you do that, though, Jackie, I do. I do like the Smith's description of of the behavioral cusp as the is like is a killer app. Oh, my gosh. When I read that, I was like, oh, but y- you see, I don't like technology ever, and you do. Oh, okay. I was like, did you make an app? I haven't seen this app, Smith. <laughs> oh, all the, they then also describe it as it's a, it's a killer app because it's an entry point for pivotal behavioral change. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking? Like, no. We just defined that for 20 minutes. So many words. Why are you using that again? But it would be helpful <laughs> if someone wanted to make an app, right? That then we could... That ask, asks you five giant, vague questions? No, no, and because the- <laughs> there's more specific questions underneath that you could ask yourself under these five variables, but then you could get like a total score. You know what everyone loves? When you're like, here's an assessment, here's five general areas you could explore. <laughs> ask whatever questions you like within them. Those are my favorite, favorite assessments. Yeah, I, do you want to explain what a killer app is? Yeah. A killer, a killer application? Here. Yeah. I didn't know until I read this. I didn't know what it was. This either. is where you learned what a killer app is. Same. I know what a kill screen is. That's I don't different. know what a kill screen is or a killer That's app. That's when you get to the end of Donkey Kong and then there's no ending because it's such an old game and the game just dies. And you're like, oh. I did it. I beat it. It's what happened at the end of Mario? Active. I've never been there. Which one? Super Mario Brothers? Super Number Mario one. Brothers has a legit ending. Number one. Yeah, it, it ends yeah. and then you can press B to do a second quest. And then if you beat that one, I think it's just slightly harder. And then at the end, you just it's like thank you mario and then it ends that you can't well, anyway, go anymore i guess josh doesn't want to he probably already knows that so okay so all a, our killer app. a killer app yeah. killer application it's sort of the, the the program the product that it in itself makes you want to purchase the device so for example celebrating i think it's 20th anniversary the halo video game was a killer app for the original xbox system because it was so good that you said man if you played it once you said i got to go buy one of these xboxes because it made everything before it obsolete. 
That's what they said in the article. Yeah, not it's so they didn't they didn't use the term properly. It's more it's more this accessing this. Oh gosh, <laughs> accessing whatever this is justifies engagement with the system itself. Again, it's a technology term. Like if a musician only put out their music on vinyl, the record player would be a killer app. No. That would be, why would I bother buying a record player? Oh, because this album came out and it's the only, it's only available as a record and it's so good. So the, the record You are going to buy a record app? player. Yes. Which one's the killer app? The record? The record's the killer app. Oh. Sort of okay. like with iPhones. Like people started loving yes. iPhones when they put the app store in because all of a sudden you had access to all the killer apps, which was every application That's confusing. never seen before. So you but bought that, an iPhone. It totally made way, made way more sense to me before this conversation. Yeah, me too. Because I was like, walking is a killer app. For crawling and scooting around on your butt because walking is way better. Why wouldn't you always do that? Well, that's not how it's supposed I'm not to be used. But they, they, they're using it wrong, and I missed that it was. I, I just like the idea of, of the behavioral cusp as like a killer app. Like you want this. Oh. This is the thing. You you want this. It's so bad. It, it just it, it makes everything else the worst. So you want to do this some more or access whatever this well, environment anyway, is. Okay. Right in. We have derailed. Yeah, we have derailed. <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario okay, Brothers was a killer app. Go ahead, Jackie. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what the five basically variables are, and then we'll go into them and the questions that you should ask yourself in them. So the first one is one of the OGs, one of the originals. Access to new reinforcers, contingencies, and environments. The second one is social validity, which is also an original. Number three, generativeness. That's a newbie. They added a newbie in there. Yep. Number four, comp competition with inappropriate responses. Also a newbie. And number five, number and relative importance of people. That one is like a mixture of old and new. Mm -hmm. And there we go. The five variables that you should consider when you are looking to target behaviors and to ask yourself whether this serves as a behavioral cusp. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about access to new reinforcers, contingencies, and environments. So they say we should ask ourselves this question. Will the response have the potential to contact new reinforcers? Or will the response give the learner access to environments? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, you can put a big why and happy face near this first variable. And the thing that you are looking for is that the behavior in and of itself, when it is emitted, produces immediate reinforcer, but then has longer term consequences above and beyond what that immediate reinforcer is. Mm -hmm. So you have to be looking for longer term effects. and. Does the behavior produce the intended outcome that you wanted, right? Immediate reinforcement. And then does it also function as a reinforcer for later production of the behavior? Yeah. So you have to be thinking about that and hypothesizing, obviously, because you won't really know about the future until the future happens. Yeah. And Smith suggests that a lot of this step is going to sort of come from your own, you know, the clinician's confidence that you know, what's the probability that that consequence that I'm planning for and assuming this is this will be a relevant cusp for this individual will come to pass and that's going to be based a lot on okay have you observed anyone else doing that engaging in that same behavior right. did it seem to access the reinforcers that you're 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 hoping will will occur were the repertoire similar to that of the clients I'm working with and do I know my client you know is this is this achievable for them in in a way that's similar enough to these other individuals and you know therefore I'd expect the same outcome right and here I think well, your discussion of the community members may be important to think about too, right? Because if you teach a client to cross the street, that obviously opens up new reinforcers, new environments, new contingencies, right? But it may be contraindicated or contradetermined if you're not allowed to cross the street, mm -hmm. right? So if you've taught it, yes, it could be a, it could be a cusp, but you're not allowed to do it, then you might have to put a no there or a maybe, right? So I think that's well, that where would, you start I mean, it would lower its it. priority. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where sort of the number and relative importance. Of, of people kind of peace comes in because sure. if the response doesn't benefit others in the sense of, well, now this individual can access all the restaurants and people and stores across right. the street, but for the caregiver, they are scared and they don't want the person to go across the street or they're worried there's danger over there. So it makes them upset or it makes them have to run across the street and bring the person back or they're embarrassed by their behavior in those. Then it, you know, it's not going to be important to that individual. I want them to stay on this side of the street, right? right? So I think it could still con you could still consider it as a behavioral cusp, but it might not be a be an important, important one to cusp. target as yeah. right. So that's all they say here. So number two is social validity, and here they talk about it as meeting the demands and ex expectations of the social community, 
and they discuss this in terms of it's going to be really important for those around the client to also believe that this behavior is an important behavior to be taught because they're going to help arrange the environment where reinforcement may occur, yeah. right? And provide opportunities for the behavior to occur. Although I think in these articles where they're writing them in the time, right? In the 2000s, early 2000s, there wasn't such a push on individualism. And so I think when they're writing them, they're like, is it important for the client? But is it more important for the parents and the right. caregivers? And so that's how I read it. And that's how I think, you know, up until the last like five or 10 years, that is how people thought like, is this important for the less. family? Right? Yeah. Even so, less. Even Yeah. So is this important for the family? We all like to, this is, I've heard this in the past. We all like to go on canoeing trips. We would really like our kid to learn how to canoe so that we as a family can canoe. Mm -hmm. Right? You're like, I hear that. Mm -hmm. This might be beneficial for the child. I'm going to teach them canoeing. Maybe the child doesn't have the repertoire to say, I hate canoeing. Right. Right. But you teach it because of the, the, the uh, expectations of the family, but never really knowing if that's going to serve as a behavioral cause for the client themselves, because we don't know if they like canoeing. Mm -hmm. They've never done it before or they, mm -hmm. you know, couldn't access that environment. So I think... And when I'm looking at this now, the social validity would have to be, does the client, is this important for the client? Number one, for the family, yes, and so that we can achieve it. But if it's not important for the client, I don't want to do it. Well, then I think maybe we want to talk about it as like that extra six. So rather than having all be kind of under the under the auspices of that, you know, just, just social validity is that, is that one of those points. We talk about social validity for the individual, and then we also talk about, I mean, I, I guess maybe it's captured in the idea of the relative importance, you know. Of, but that of, one, and that one really talks about benefiting other people. So maybe that's, right? so So when we talk about social validity, we just want to talk about the client the client themselves, and then, right. you know, number and relative importance of people. But again, I think that's a real limitation in sort of the research we have here, because we talk about, here are five things, and right. yes or no for all of them. And if it's got right. five yeses, it's good. But I, I think we, we want to go deeper. Like, how much are you going to weigh number five? Right. You know, while I think logistically we do have to understand that, well, if everybody in the community hates this behavioral cause except for the client, you know, our ethical responsibility is to the client. Like, no, this is what the client wants. Ergo should be what the client gets. You know, if everyone else in the community says, no, we hate that cusp. It's the worst and we'll punish it. Is there a value in teaching the individual? Well, I might weigh the fact that everyone else hates it low in my planning document for the individual because I care about the individual's opinion of what right. goals you know they're interested in. But, but then you find the community. If the community they're... hates it, but yeah, then you find okay, the communities. There are right? steps to take. There are yeah, steps. There to are take. different steps to take. Right? Like if you think of my small ass hometown. Sorry, I said the word yeah. ass twice now. Right? And you say like in my town there was. And I'm not going to knock it, just is what I've been thinking about recently, like kids that like to play D&D, &D, right? That yeah. was like not something that was like cool and something that you should do, right? In my town, okay. in the early 90s. Okay. Right? And it wasn't a Stranger Things situation. It wasn't a Stranger Things situation. You should have been playing hockey and listening to Tragically Hit, basically. Okay. But let's say, right, it's important for a kid. They love games. They love board games. It's important for a kid to access community. They are not good at hockey. They don't like the Tragically Hip. Let's put it. I don't know how you can't like the Tragically Hip. But anyway, right? And so they're like, this is important to me. I want to access a community that thinks like me, right? So then who cares what their immediate community says, right? But I find them a community that values the behaviors that they want to engage in. And then I set them up with that. Right. So that they don't, not everyone can like fit into the norm of the society that they're in. And that's okay. Right. Because all communities are different. So that's what I would do is find a community that supports the behaviors that is the most important for the individual. Cause it can happen. Right. My husband is testimony to that. Yeah. I think there, I think there are other things we have to take into account <laughs> when we're discussing changing communities, because depending on the level of change or the need for change or the resources for change, it may or may not be, feasible sure. for all individuals but in the world of the internet it's real easy true I, well i think i think there's i think there are more needs for workarounds than just no we should change the community right. there we go i think that's might be a little bit too much of like we as adults can change our community really easily if we want to and that's not going to be the case for for every individual for a number of reasons but you're right jackie that should be the goal yes and keeping it in mind that it's, it should be the goal even if it's not 
readily yes. understandable how you would achieve that. Right. Goal. We have to think go- highest gold standard in the best interest of our clients first, and then we might have to compromise. Yeah. I mean, Smith goes a little bit more into that in terms of their discussions of person-centered planning, and they have their sort of bullet, not bullet, what's that called? That's a target. It's like a, like an arrow target of sort of, you know, the individual is at the center, and then, you know, the, the client should think of their own strengths and what's relevant to them in terms of uh, tar- developing the cusps. target. And you then you have... Like, what is that? The, tar- the target. It's concentric circles. Concentric circles. It's a Ooh. target. That's a, that's what a target is. It's a it series is. of concentric circles. Yeah. And then you've got your, you know, your distal groups. You've got your sort of, you know, the family. And then you've got the friends and teachers and politicians. <laughs> uh, that was one of the one of the categories and kind of the next layer. And then like everyone else in the it's community. Like the biggest layer out and you there. You make the, make well, the circle. Well, those are the right? The circle of stakeholders, they called it. Yum, yum, yum. The yeah. circle <laughs> of stakeholders. So that, that kind of, I think, gets at both the social validity as well as the importance to people, to people affected. Yeah. And then, there we and go. then I like yeah. competition with inappropriate responses and generativeness. We didn't talk about those two. Nope. Uh, you know, again, I think Smith has the better examples of the two of them in terms of, well, what do you mean by generativeness? And again, the idea that, well, if you can set up behavioral cusps that can then be recombined with other behaviors to lead to, you know, take your minimal repertoire access so much reinforcement for those middle repertoires that it shapes up into more complex response class, which is really where Smith and, and colleagues are coming from. They're really talking about cusps. They're kind of getting back to some of that developmental piece of cusps as ways to teach complex behaviors. Like everything else you teach is sort of a one single response to an SD, but cusps will somehow magically take all of those individual responses and turn them into sort of a magic lump of great behavior that we didn't have before. They didn't say lump. I just, that's mine. Behavioral lump what we'll call it but they had an example of like nancy who i don't know why they put this in generativeness i'm wondering if my notes are out of out of order but you know nancy had serious problem behaviors so they taught her to clean books in a library where it was quiet there was nothing going on and then from those initial skills of i can put the books away she started getting more and more jobs at the library and then she was able to engage in the jobs I, they, didn't they quite... were excited about that though because then they were like right, eventually yeah. she worked there for seven years and got person of the year yeah Wait, it was oh, great. Nancy? I don't know if that's an example of, of, of necessarily, I guess it would be generated as more than competition with inappropriate responses, but I sort of, I sort of saw it as both. Yeah. If you're in a quiet location or your job is tell people be quiet and like man quiet, well, that's what you're supposed to do in the library. And if that's what you happen to also like, you know, environments that are quiet, great. You've, you you got everything going. Everything's coming up you. Yeah. Everything's think, coming up Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> we got the shirt says Nancy on it. <laughs> Number three and four, you know, I think go together in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, but they do make the good distinction is that in a behavior may serve as a cusp in one situation, right? But not in another. Mm-hmm. So we really yeah. have to be mindful that we are not just like teaching a behavior that will then go forth in all situations, mm-hmm. right? We have to use other principles. We just can't teach a cusp. Yeah. And I'd love to say, and here's some more information for those articles, but honestly, they didn't have much more to say about behavioral cusps and choosing behavioral cusps outside of here are five points you want to take into account. How much do you take each one into account compared to the other? Are there exact questions you're going to ask about each of those general goals? Right, but the last one was number and relative importance of people, which we didn't talk about, really. We kind of did, but not really. Mm. Right, and they just say to ask the question as, does the response benefit others? So how far reaching in the community do you need to think about and who will be affected by this cusp? Right? Yeah. Because if you're looking for ways to increase reinforcement in the environment, then choosing a socially valid cusp, not just for the client, but for other members of their life and community, then choosing something that's going to produce reinforcement for them and thereby, you know, collaterally produce reinforcement for the client as well is going to make that response more likely to maintain in that environment. Mm-hmm. I think what's tricky is you just don't know. When you are selecting behavioral targets, what could end up being most important, right? Like, you say, developmentally, we can apply some of what we know when we're particularly if we're working with young kids, right? But what we've been talking about here is really idiosyncratic situations where something comes in, you know, in retrospect, we're like, oh, that was a cusp because look at all the ways in which they learned new things and grew because they found that new avenue so reinforcing but it wasn't necessarily predictable at the time Mm. i think that also speaks to being creative Mm -hmm. in our approach and being really open-minded in what we're exposing clients to and not just shutting things down by saying oh they they won't like that right 
we I don't think, know. I think this is heading us into dissemination station. Mm. Yes. It does feel that way. <sighs> Here we are. And to sort of, because I wanted to res- respond to okay. your point, Diana, the example they give, you know, talked about Sarah going to the basketball game. You're assuming when you develop the cusp, well, the community will probably like that okay that she's there that she's you know the cusp of going to the games because you know if she's buying things at the concession stand we assume that people at the concession stand want to sell sarah things we assume that other basketball players will appreciate all of sarah's cheering you know we assume that and if they had this idea of that the local paper when writing about the basketball game will talk about her as like a number one fan or it's like oh she doesn't miss a game we'll report on it as a positive thing that like individual with disabilities is here at the game rather than like oh who let all these people like with disabilities in our game to me well no but just that idea of you're right there are so i didn't even think about a single one of those people in terms of like the cusp like sarah seemed to want to go to the games and her parent or grandparents seemed happy at all of the new things she was doing at the games ergo that's a slam slam dunk of a behavioral cusp but what if everyone else in the community around Sarah really didn't like when she was there? The way she cheered annoyed them, or she ordered things strange, or made bad orders, or paid with pennies, or who knows? There's all sorts of ways it could have, quote unquote, gone wrong. And then they need to deal with it. Paying with pennies is so cool. And, and, and it, but I think it's easy to say the community needs to deal with it, but we can't make the community no, that's true, but deal with it. So, training. Uh, so we I want love to paying put with pennies, try. by the way. No, oh, I love, we, we can do a lot of things, but, but I love paying with pennies. Oh, that's so terrible. You know. You're the worst. I know. <laughs> Nobody let you yes, have any cups. Pennies are worthless. <laughs> Here's 800 pennies. <laughs> oh. So that's $8. Every I think that just goes into the idea of, you know, we have to plan our cups and it's not as easy to think about like, well, the individual loves this and I know it would give them access to all these reinforcers and I bet they love it. Therefore, the most important cusp is what I am proposing today because the questions we have are very large and there are no you know, there aren't that many specifics and some of the specifics you can come up with are going to be, like you said, Jackie, idiosyncratic to the person you are currently working with. It's fuzzy. It's right? very fuzzy. That's why there's no empirical research on this, because it's fuzzy and subjective and long term, it's hard to quantify, right? Whether it does serve, like, how would we do a FA on cusps, right? Well, I think it's less about doing an FA on cusps and more about can we narrow down a bit more sort of based on these sources of reinforcement, these communities, these skills, here are some questions you want to ask yourself. They're not an exhaustive list of the questions, but here are some, here are some areas you might want to ask. And then maybe here's how you could look at assessing whether it was or was not a cusp or was or was not verifying effective. whether it was a cusp. Yep. I love that. Assess and then verify once it's happening. Yeah. And we and, and again, will it be, you know, I mean, what are we looking at? Like quality of life indicators? You could use that. You could potentially do, you know, a, a nice little Likert scale of what do you think about, about these cups? You could open ended questions. Yeah. You could do open ended questions. You could sort of measure, uh, you know, the response to other members in the community where this new cusp is occurring. Do they seem excited? You could. You could sample some people about like, oh, what do you think about blank or, you know, this change? And, or the individual, right? Are they well, definitely, the yeah, you, you yeah, yeah. But beyond right. the individual, just to answer some of the questions that I think are, are the harder ones for, yeah. for us to just come up with right off the bat. I'd like to think we can come up with the ones that are relevant to the individual a lot more quickly than we can. Some of the pieces related to call up my, my senator. Hey, <laughs> what do you think about this? Son? What do you think? You are on record four of the concentric circles for. <laughs> So I'm just giving you a call. See how you feel. <laughs> and then maybe even look at, okay, well, how, how, how should we be thinking about maybe weighing some of these options? You know, not necessarily with this one gets a five, therefore it goes higher in the, in the hierarchy of cusps. But, you know, which factors based on, you know, I'm not even sure how we would base them on. But, but is, there, is there some I sort of metric change. we could sort of use to generally determine, you know, if you don't have a community support in this area, certain cusps like this, like these types might be more challenging and you would need to do further planning or further right. work with the community. Well, I think the assessment will change based on what the expectations are in the community and what the expectations are about treatment planning, right? Mm. Because we've seen a drastic shift in treatment planning and more person-centered treatments now, right? So if we had made this assessment in the early 2000s, well, we would have to make a probably a 7.0 at this point, Right. So I think it has to be more flexible than a than a sheet paper. Like if you're just like, yep, no, like this is two times the points as this one, right? I think it's going to need to be a little more 
It's not just a checklist. Yeah. No. It's got to be a little more fluid. Yeah. I love when people say that and they move like that. <laughs> what about, okay, what about a flow chart? Maybe. But I bet again, we can do a better flow chart. But again, the flow chart's going to change based on the societal expectations, right? So I think. Depend- yeah, but your flow chart would go like, are the societal expectations against this? Yes or no? And then you'd go from there to like, you might need to do more research about. Right, but the experience. Right, but then different, I think different like numbers, if you're thinking about that, may have more weight at certain points in time. That's what I think anyway. So, right, like at this point in time, I'm really adamant about the individual coming first, right? I'm very adamant about that right now in this point of time, in this history of time, right? In 20 years, may that may change. You right, won't so, care about the individual? Well, I might not. <laughs> I will still, but you don't know. Like, I don't know if that will still be number one based on what happens right yeah. now. Right? So, I mean, I think that if the the number one takeaway is let's focus on the individual, I don't know that you need to go through the cusp route to do that. That's true. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there's nothing wrong with thinking about it as, is this a cusp? <laughs> But also just saying, is this important to the individual? Is this something that they're going to continue to engage in because it's something that they like or it's an extension of something that they like? Then it's naturally going to continue to contact reinforcement in the environment and likely provide new opportunities for behavioral growth on its own. And then the conversation about whether it's a cusp or not is a little bit moot, I would say. So that just highlights the importance of coming from a client-centered perspective there. But I think we're also, if you have a young learner, or maybe you're not really sure what their interests are, looking at cusps from as it fits in with a developmental perspective can be helpful, right? So that you're getting things in the right order and you're working on teaching like just the next step up, right? And thinking about, Using this scaffolding, thinking about what would the likely reinforcers be if my client could now do this particular skill. But that's not the only piece, too. We want to think about the likely ease of teaching that skill because we want our clients to be successful and having a high rate of reinforcement in the teaching environment is is really important. And then we also want to think about the opportunities that that behavior is going to have to maintain and generalize in the natural setting. So is this a behavior that the parents and the family are also going to find reinforcing and likely to, the behavior is likely to be exhibited in that setting. And then the parents are likely to reinforce it in that setting as well. I think all of those are important pieces when we're attempting to select target behaviors. And a lot of those are going to be cusps, but it's not the only lens necessarily that we could use to make those selections. Mm. Bam! So what I'm hearing <laughs> is, don't worry about it. At some point, you'll decide don't if it was a, if, it. If, if if you're doing your best to plan for the individual to access more reinforcement in the, in their day and and learn skills that will allow them to be more independent. At some point, you'll say, "Oh, I guess that was a cusp. That one there was a cusp. Oh, that's great." <laughs> if you have a list of you know twenty things to pick from. You can start by picking things that are likely to be cusps. Right. Right? Done. But you won't know but until you won't you've know. already taught you might it. Not, you might not know. But if you come at it from the perspective of importance for the client, the family, and the skills that are likely going to be kind of like the next thing that would be probably learned that's going to access additional reinforcers, then I think you're on the right track. Sames. Mm. Hashtag same. Well, I'll be honest. I feel like of all our episodes, usually we, we talk about this topic and I feel like there's some great new information. I, I, I'm feeling like this one was a little like, oh, yeah, I what, guess really? that's nice to I know. I don't think so. But I, ooh, I well. learned a lot. Aww. I probably so could. Sad. could well, it's not your fault. You didn't develop the I concept. a long time. Well, I, I, I think there's it, smart things, things that were said and I certainly learned things. But I think part of what I learned is, hmm, maybe this doesn't need to get as much attention. As no, I, well, it I think sounds like it, it would when you're first describing the concept. I think if you're already well familiar with the concept of cusps, then you might circle back to the perspective that we're at now. But yeah. if you haven't been planning with the idea of cusps in mind, it's revolutionary. Then it's really important. Yeah. 
right? Because then you're not just thinking about what we're going to do now, but you're thinking about what we're going to do now and how's that going to build mm-hmm. on what we're going to do later and what we want to happen later. Yes. You're already doing it, Rob. So no, just- I, I just, again, it just feels like one of those concepts of like, no, I guess so. But at the same time, I could have done that. If no one had ever used the phrase cusp and I just was thinking about the oh, future yeah, of an individual, I, mean, I also could have, I could have probably gotten to the same point. Sure, sure. I, and I, and I, I, I don't think we need the the term, right? So we, do, we don't one, need to ascribe as much importance to the term, perhaps, as I think sometimes it is given. I think we don't need the term, but I think the term is useful for new practitioners, right? I don't think we need the term. We never need any of our terms, right? Like, really, we don't. Everyone hates our terms, too. Right? So maybe we so, should just get rid of them. But this, right? New so, terms. We don't need the term, but I think it is a helpful guidepost for when, just like we said, the problem is... We have done this assessment. We have all of these skills that need to work on. What do we target? This is one of the things we can think about. Okay. Yeah. All right. I need to weed out these 20 skills. Can't teach 20 skills in 20 hours, right? A week. Don't have that. So how can I weed out the ones that may not be as beneficial right right now for my client? Looking at, okay, this one may be a behavioral cusp. Put it to swipe right. You had to pick between... Teaching someone to say please and request help. Pick request help. Right. Because that's a cusp. Right. If you had to pick between teaching someone to play with Mr. Potato Head or going to pick anything that they want to occupy themselves, pick the anything that they want to occupy themselves. Right there. Cusp. Cusp. Cool. We did it. Okay. We're done. Well, I don't want to talk about cusp anymore. So that (laughs) means the episode's over. Hooray. Thank you all so much for listening. If you were watching all of this live, then you missed, you know, so many, so many exciting tangents that and swear a lot of swear words. Maybe. One of our one of our listeners liked walking is a killer app. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like after I learned to walk, I wanted to buy the shoes I was wearing and get rid of my old chair. All right. Well, thank you if you were here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. If you're watching this on video, we hope you enjoyed that as well. Don't forget if you have access to that, you're able to get a discount on your CE for this episode. If you're just listening to this when it normally comes out, well, you could have got a discount. You would have had to go to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track and subscribed. And if you did, you'd also get that discount. And you know what? Actually, you still could. You still could, but you weren't here in the moment. You just get to watch the video after the fact. Oh, well, that's still pretty good, I hope. Thank you to Jackie and Diana. Thank you to the authors of our paper. A couple places that if you like ABA Inside Track and you want more, you can get more. You can certainly subscribe to the podcast. You can find us on all the social medias as ABA Inside Track. We already talked about Patreon. I plugged that enough. You can go to our website to find links to all of these articles as well as to purchase CEs for this and other episodes. And you can find all these on YouTube with the YouTube subtitle feature if you are so inclined. Or you can always shoot us a little email at ABA Inside Track at Gmail dot com and the final thing is the second code word hey rob remember you need to have the second code word because i don't want to have to record it later and then paste it in it's a pain i'll tell it to you now it's, people email me asking where the second uh, code that, word that is. rarely happens solo is the second code word s-o-l-o solo whether it's the han solo movie or a solo cup I have a favorite yours. Star Wars movie, Free Solo. Free, that, no, it's not a Star Wars movie. It's a movie about a guy who climbs things. I, I was thinking that if you eat all of the chips and cookies, you will be solo. Nobody will want to hang out with you. Oh. Because you ate all you the ate- snacks. Right. There's none left. Oh, because you, cause you can't go near that person because they're going to eat all your snacks? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's the friend I am. Okay. I'm the snack eater. Oh, I just made that up. It's so good. <gasps> Solo. Oh, here I come. All right. That's what well, people leave. <laughs> that's it. It's time to be done with the show. Thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro outro music, Kyle Story for our interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work. He's got a lot of work ahead of him, I think, on this one. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye.